Welcome to All Things Photonics, a podcast about the physical science of light driving scientific innovation in the 21st century. I'm Joel Williams, Associate Editor at Photonics Media. Join us as we explore the latest trends in optics, lasers, microscopy, and spectroscopy. Each episode, you'll hear from leading voices from across the photonics landscape, brought to you by Photonics Media. From a scientific perspective, and put very simply, the key to understanding is through measurement. The complicated part is knowing what to measure, followed closely by an assurance of accuracy. Today's guests could scarcely be better suited to conquer those complications. Joe Shaw, Distinguished Professor and Director of Montana State University's Optical Technology Center, checks in with news editor Joe Williams. And later, I speak with Sonathana Kanugalu, co-founder of Optical Phantoms technology developer Biopix S. As one of the foremost experts in remote sensing, Joe Shaw's expertise lies, in part, in knowing what to measure and how to measure it. In his own words, remote sensing can be described in simple terms as measuring without touching. It's an area of application that envelops almost every technology in the photonics landscape. And in the Montana landscape, as well as the broader landscape of planet Earth, remote sensing provides insight into some of the most pressing questions about our world. Matters of changing climates, fundamental questions about the physical processes of natural phenomena are explored via remote sensing. Matters of changing climates and fundamental questions about the physical processes of natural phenomena are explored via remote sensing. Technologies like autonomous driving are also scrutinized through this lens. Up next, Joe Williams speaks with Joe Shaw from Montana State University. So when someone asks, you know, what do you do uh, for a living? Uh, and you mentioned, you mentioned remote sensing. Uh, almost inevitably, they're going to ask, you know, what is that? You know, it's a, something that we encounter a lot, you know, when somebody asks, you know, what's our magazine about? And it's uh, pretty difficult to explain. So how do you approach that? I like the phrase to describe remote sensing because this remote sensing is really thought of in very different ways by different people. So I like to start with the phrase measuring without touching. I'm going to measure something and it might be near me or it might be very, very far away from me, but I'm going to measure it without touching. And to get the technology side in, I tried to explain that essentially I make fancy lasers and fancy cameras to to make environmental measurements. Awesome. So now remote sensing uh, incorporates, you know, a lot of different photonic technologies, you know, infrared, LIDAR, hyperspectral, uh, et cetera. Uh, but it seems to be approaching it uh, in a lot of really unique ways. Uh, I'm thinking uh, particularly about your work uh, using LIDAR to measure honeybees uh, that detect landmines. You know, right. what sort of opportunities does remote sensing open up, you know, in terms of that kind of creative engineering and problem solving? Uh, and what do you enjoy about that? Oh, what I what I really love about about what I do is exactly what you've hit on is is uh, or at least hinted at. The first thing I think of when I hear that question is the um, excitement of having to learn new things every day. So I get people coming to me saying, well, can you measure this or can you measure that? And that's that's very exciting because then I uh, I have to think about, well, could I measure that? <laughs> and, you know, usually the answer is, I don't know, let me try. And we could waste a lot of time if we did that without having to think more carefully. And so it, it leads to a lot of different experiments, a lot of di different experiments to just try things. And then we try things and it looks like, well, that's not going to work. Or we discover some fundamental physics reason why it's not going to work. And of course, we'll abandon it at that point. But more often than not, it leads us down a path of, of discovering new applications. And then in several cases, really rich collaborations. And that's that's the funnest part about it is meeting new people and working with them and learning about their field a little bit as we as we develop our technology to adapt to new applications and, and new opportunities. It's, um, you know, we talk all about the technology, 
But in the end, it's all about the people. When when people ask me, what do I really like about what I do? It's 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 meeting people and then being friends with them for decades. And, you know, I'm getting old enough now that I can really see that and appreciate that that has been the, the real rewarding part of my career. But of course, it all starts with the technology and the science. And so that's that's really great. So really learning new things, le learning, learning how to solve new problems is is what is the exciting part of it with me. Awesome. Uh, now, as we've noted, uh, you know, remote sensing uh, incorporates, you know, a lot of different methods and technologies uh, and a lot of different people. Um, how do advancements in other fields affect your work? You know, are there any developments uh, that you see coming down the line? Uh, you know, and these can be pretty far off or, you know, a long ways from commercialization. Uh, but, you know, are there any research works that you've seen that you think would have potential in your field of work? Uh, or, you know, alternatively, are there, you know, specific advancements or capabilities uh, that you would like to see and incorporate? Oh, yeah, and I'll I'll start close to home. Uh, I'll start with things that we're literally working on right now, and because those are the first things that pop into my head. But of, of course, we're always looking ahead. We're always, as researchers, we're always looking around us and looking ahead, trying to see what the new fun thing would be um what the new capability that's going to revolutionize our measurements and you know sometimes we see those coming and often we just don't and something all of a sudden comes up and we're just like oh, oh wow that's cool let's try that um but i'll give you a couple examples of things that i'm directions that i'm reaching out and sort of incorporating into my work you know i i'm an optics guy i i do optical design, I develop optical sensor systems, I'm really good at doing calibrations, really good at learning how to turn an optical system into a physical measuring device. And because, because that involves so many different technologies working together synergistically, I'm always benefiting from the work of others in fields that I'm not really qualified to make contributions to. And so a couple of examples are uh, embedded computers. You know, we all have cell phones that have tiny little computer chips in them, and those have gotten very capable. Well, those cell phones themselves are actually becoming more and more part of what we do. But I'm talking more about taking similar computer chips and putting them directly into the optical device. So instead of just having a camera, now we have a smart camera. and we have a camera system that can that can ingest far more data than it could before and process it in real time and this opens up the door to doing things like you know uav or drone based imaging with real time processing and you know that this is there are people out there who will say oh we're we're working on that and that's because, yeah, a lot of people are working in this direction. That's an exciting direction. And that, of course, also requires intelligent algorithms to run efficiently and process huge amounts of data. And so that taps into the whole growth mode that is that we see around us right now in AI and machine learning and, and similar kinds of intelligent algorithms. And then similarly, the I, I mentioned flying on drones, you know, autonomous systems of, of all kinds. I think those three things working together are really changing the face of the kind of work I do in my lab. And um, then more on the optical technology side and maybe looking out a little bit further, um, there's a lot of exciting things going on with uh, nano engineered optical materials and optical devices. And I don't do that work, but I have colleagues who do, and I'm collaborating with them. And we think that we see a really exciting future for making smaller, cheaper, better versions of the kinds of systems that I already know how to design, like polarization imagers. We, we think we can make much smaller, cheaper, better versions that can solve very practical problems for the world. And, you know, I actually, I should mention a, at least one other thing, and that 
this this actually harkens back to where where I've already come from, but I think you'll see much more of this in the future. As basic science pushes the boundaries of what technology is there in areas like tunable lasers or stabilized, you know, wavelength stabilized lasers. That kind of research is very, very fundamental, and some people don't see the application of that. But what they may not realize is that that kind of research spawns all kinds of technological advances. And then people like me come along and say, oh, well, I can take that tunable laser and make a, a really exciting new LIDAR system out of it. And so there, there's a lot of basic research going on right now in both quantum materials and quantum devices and laser physics that is going to open the door for new uh, measurement systems that uh, people like me will be building in the years to come. Excellent. Uh, you mentioned uh, briefly polarization um, imaging. Uh, you know, can you tell us about uh, about that and the opportunities that that modality uh, presents in terms of you know understanding the world around us? Sure. Um, polarization is an I like to think of it as an added dimension of optical measurements. So we know. When we think about remote sensing, especially, a lot of people just think about immediately about satellites. And that, of course, is probably the most common type of remote sensing, but it is absolutely not the only uh, way to do remote sensing. I, I do most of my remote sensing from the ground, from ships, from airplanes, from uh, UAVs. And satellite systems though people can relate to because we've all gotten to be in our modern world it's very common to see and think about satellite images you know it wasn't that many decades ago that seeing the earth from space was had never been done and then it would had only been done a few times and now it's just commonplace we see it all over the web um when you look at those images the 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 typical way that information is gathered is from shape, from color, and from brightness. But there's another dimension of the optical signal that that, that all ignores, and that's the polarization of the light. And so polarization refers to the preference of the orientation of the electric field. So we, we all probably know that, that light can be considered an electromagnetic wave, and that electromagnetic wave has an electric field that oscillates. And if it oscillates in some preferred direction, we call that polarization. And that polarization can be measured. It, it's not as easy to measure as the other things that I mentioned. Uh, some people think it is, and then that usually leads them immediately into the little uh, minefields that those of us who have been doing polarization imaging for years have known about and there's just it seems like you put a polarizer in your instrument and all kinds of crazy things start to happen you get reflections from the polarizer you get reflections inside the polarizer you get uh you know the, the all these reflections cause other polarized signals and and they just they cause ghost images and all kinds of things um but what do you benefit from that? Well, when you add polarization to a measurement and, and get around some of those initial little hiccups that, that happen inevitably along the way, you immediately gain the ability to measure this extra dimension and it has extra information. So, you know, remote sensing is all about gleaning information from, from a measurement that I can make here to learn something about something that is over there. And whether that over there is Earth seen from space, space seen from Earth, or maybe the river seen from my drone. It, it's, you know, it's all, it's all I'm here with my camera and I'm looking over there. Polarization can add a lot of information and is adding a lot of information now about aerosols, which are airborne particles, a really, really critical part of the climate puzzle. 
In fact, one of the one of the leading uncertainties in climate understanding and climate modeling is aerosols and clouds and their interactions. And so there's a huge push right now to develop new remote sensing technology to measure those environmental parameters. And so you can think about when I talk about aerosols, you can think about wildfire smoke or soot from uh, factories and and car exhaust and you know all the stuff we put into our atmosphere that ends up we or mother nature puts into the atmosphere and and those particles can significantly alter the amount of sunlight reaching the earth or the or even the amount of uh, radiation escaping back out to space so the climate balance depends critically on understanding those things well, the climate balance just involves those things. Understanding the climate balance requires understanding those things. And so, for example, there the next generation of satellites that are already preparing for launch in the next year are going to be carrying polarization imagers. And so we think of this still as kind of a new remote sensing method, but it's going to become mainstream here pretty quickly. And we will have polarization imagers in space studying both atmospheric properties and water properties, ocean properties, for example. And then there's there's a lot of uh, military applications as well. We can we can find man-made stuff hiding under camouflage. You can see into shadows. There's all kinds of benefits of doing polarization imaging, and and a lot of those have been known for a while, and the technology is just catching up to make it practical now. Excellent. Uh, now, uh, environmental sensing is, you know, one of the major applications uh, for remote sensing. Uh, and increasingly, you know, changes in the environment are becoming, you know, more and more obvious, you know, specifically, you know, the increasing frequency of natural disasters and extreme weather events. Uh, how can remote sensing help us to you know, maybe not address these problems, uh, but just to be more aware of them uh, and provide warnings. Well, for all of all of those kinds of things, what we really need is more data and specifically data from data starved regions of the Earth. Or if you want to extend your view, data starved regions of the universe and remote sensing instruments operating on the ground on ships and airplanes and satellites will be w the source of of those data that are needed so badly and i'll give you one example the we've known for a long time from climate modeling that climate change should operate most strongly and first earliest in the arctic and you know polar and, and subpolar regions and we see evidence of that happening but that is an example of kind of a data starved area of the earth. There just aren't a lot of cities. There aren't a lot of people and there aren't a lot of sensors sitting out there operating because it's an extremely harsh environment. Um, a lot of satellites can see the Arctic, but it turns out it's very difficult to measure things in the Arctic as something as simple as telling where clouds are and where clouds are not. If you look down on the Arctic from above, in the visible region, you see white on white. So you can't really easily detect clouds. If you look in the thermal infrared, you see cold on cold, or from another perspective, warm on warm. In other words, there's very little color contrast, there's very little brightness contrast, and there's very little thermal contrast. So you need, you need other tricks. And you know some of those tricks involve flipping the problem upside down and putting putting a network of sensors on the ground looking up, and that's something I've been involved with over the years is developing technologies that can sit on the ground and look up and measure clouds in the Arctic. Um, but there's a tremendous amount of engineering to be done to make some network of systems that can live and continue to operate outdoors in the harsh Arctic environment. So that's just one example of how remote sensing really is filling in the gaps that we need in order to understand what's happening and 
therefore have some chance of predicting what might happen next. Absolutely. You know, uh, talking about the environment, you know, it's uh, it's pretty easy to, you know, for things to get you know, a little bit scary or depressing <laughs> yeah. kind of, you know, kind of quickly. Um, but, you know, a lot of the work that you do, uh, though, is, you know, it's helping us to understand basic things about the way that the world works. Uh, you know, things like cloud formation, uh, ice formation, you know, phenomenon like that. Um, What's a good example of a study that you've done uh, that's revealed something uh, that you found fascinating and made you go like, wow, you know, that's, you know, that's interesting. Well, you know, let me go back to where you started. To, to me, it's not so depressing I, and I totally get what you're saying, right? It, 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 it is easy to. To feel depressed when you read about environmental problems, but. To me, the, the depressing aspect is when there's a problem that's so large that we feel helpless and we feel like there's nothing we can do. I'm so deeply immersed in doing something about those problems that I tend to not get depressed about them. I get sort of motivated by them. And so I choose to at least try to look at it that way. And um, I get really excited when I learn new things about how nature works. And that's that's just really a deeply satisfying process, and it happens very rarely. We spend most of our careers doing, you know, writing proposals and writing reports and even writing papers and teaching classes. And that's not always leading to understanding new things, but every once in a while we get a glimpse into how Mother Nature works. And that's a deeply satisfying experience. And it's one that I wish more people could understand and appreciate. Uh, I'll give you one example from quite a few years ago in my in my early career. I had built a laser system that operated on on a ship. It was kind of a a weird ship. If if you want to have fun, go look it up on the web. It's called Flip, the Floating Instrument Platform. It doesn't operate anymore, but but back then it it was operating. It was a U.S. Navy ship. It's unpowered, so it gets towed into place by a tugboat. And then they it's like it looks like a long baseball bat. And the baseball bat part of it is a tube that gets filled with water so that it flips right or uh, 90 degrees so that what used to be the front of the ship is now pointing straight up in the air. And it was developed as a stable platform to sit in the ocean and do do acoustic measurements. You know, it it was a Navy ship and that I think it was developed primarily for de detecting and studying uh, submarines. But we were using it to study the air water interface. What happens to the sea surface when the atmosphere changes that kind of thing? And I had developed a laser instrument to create laser, so I would call them artificial, except for they're not artificial, they're real. Uh, I was creating laser glitter patterns. If you've seen the sunlight reflecting from the rippled ocean surface or even a river or lake, that's a glitter pattern, that that pattern of, of reflections. And that that those glitter patterns can be used to infer information about the roughness of the water surface. So I was measuring, I was developing a new method to to measure the roughness, the small scale roughness of the ocean surface. And the reason we were working on this is because it goes back to what I said before about data starved regions of the Earth. If we want to know sort of four or five days out what the weather is going to do, we need to know what the weather is doing over speaking from a United States perspective, we need to know what the weather's doing over the Pacific Ocean. And we don't have weather stations sitting in the Pacific Ocean. I mean, we do, right? We have some buoys, but it's it's a data sparse part of the world. Satellites are looking down and there's a few buoys and there's some sensors on ships, but by and large, the Pacific is a very, very vast part of the world that, that lacks data. And so we were trying to develop a new method for satellites to look down on the on the ocean and develop and sense wind speeds and wind directions because that's a big part of the puzzle of what's gonna 
happen, you know, this coming weekend? Is the weather going to have, is it going to be good for my barbecue or not? And we don't know that right now. We can sort of predict. Well, so we were in the midst of this process, and I tried to compare my data with with a model that somebody else had made back in the 1950s, and it's the model that's primarily used by by everybody in doing these kinds of studies. And my data did not match that model, and I was depressed. Yeah, you want to talk about depressing? That's when you get depressed when you when you go out and you conduct an experiment, and then you plot your data and you think it's all garbage. And I woke up one morning and I I had this thought. Why don't I try plotting it against a different variable? Instead of plotting it against the variable that those guys used back in the 50s, why don't I do something different? And I had a specific idea in mind. We had just fortunately put another sensor on that ship and it, it was measuring the air water temperature difference. And I thought, well, I wonder what happens if I plot it against that. And so I went and I, I figured out some parameter from that instrument to measure my data against. And voila, it came out on this beautiful curve. And I realized that, oh my gosh, my data are not wrong. My data are new. They're showing something that I've never seen before. And that is that the, the ripples, those little ripples that you see on the water surface that create these glitter patterns, those ripples become more ripply. The surface becomes more ripply when the air and water temperature are different. And the previous model had been developed by looking at the water around Hawaii, the Hawaiian islands. And so the air and water were pretty much the same temperature, the skin temperature of the water. And we were off the coast of Oregon and it was very different meteorological conditions. There was something new and there were hints of it in the literature, but but basically I had learned something new that I never knew about how Mother Nature worked that, you know, and that might seem like a really esoteric thing. It's like, OK, the water becomes more rippled when the air when the water is warmer than the air. So what? Well, it matters because if you're looking at those roughness signatures and trying to relate them to the wind speed, you have to know that. And so that just tells you that, OK, now when you do remote sensing for wind speed, you need to look at both the roughness and the temperature contrast. And both of those things together will reveal this this information. So that's just one example. But, you know, there's there's other things that. That I've really gotten excited about, not so much learning about nature, but just making making advances that I think are going to be helpful for humanity. So for example, we developed not that many years ago an airborne LIDAR system that we used to map out spawning locations of invasive lake trout in Yellowstone Lake, which is in Yellowstone National Park. You know, if I can help preserve the Yellowstone ecosystem, I will have lived a meaningful life. That that right there is is a worthwhile thing to do. And so, yeah, I I derive great satisfaction from making sometimes small steps, but sometimes step, small steps that have major impact. Excellent. Uh, let's see, you uh, you mentioned at the beginning uh, of um, your answer that, um, you know, the work you do and your involvement, um, you know, it tends to give you hope. Um, yeah. Uh, and you you just you just touched on this, but I was I was wondering if you might be able to you know talk a little bit uh, about you know how learning more information uh, allows us to address you know these kinds of you know Godzilla sized problems that seem you know insurmountable. Well, big problems seem insurmountable, I think, because well, perhaps from two different directions. One is they're big. But the other is they're mysterious. We we just don't know how to solve them. And if you start understanding the world and how it works, and if you start understanding what is causing the problem, then that often leads to ideas for how to fix the problem. And you know, sometimes those fixes work profoundly well. And as an example, I'll I'll raise an example that that I had nothing to do with. 
but it's it's a huge scientific success from the 1970s by and large and that is the the ozone hole problem we we still have an ozone hole and we still study that you know i don't but other people do but by and large that problem has been that huge problem that was going to lead to worldwide catastrophe level problems is now no longer that big of a threat because we understand the chemistry and the physics of what causes that depletion of ozone. The ozone protects us from, from harmful rays from the sun that would give us all skin cancer or other problems. And the ozone was disappearing rapidly. And what was discovered is the chemical processes that were leading to that depletion. And it's, a, it's an example of, and I would say, sadly, one of the rare examples of where the scientific community and the political community reacted together very quickly. And, you know, certain chemicals were banned. And that led to a turnaround. And so now, by and large, we're seeing an improvement. You know, the, the ozone hole is still there, but it's the, the problem isn't getting as bad as we feared that it was going to get. And it's not uh, it's not it's not a growing threat to mankind. That gives me hope because we can do that with other big problems, too. If we understand the root science, that's our only hope for solving the problem. And what it requires, though, is almost always when when there are huge problems of, you know, kind of global threat level of problems, it requires the science community and the people at large and the politicians who who make the laws and implement the laws of the world they all have to work together and that's that's the only thing that makes me depressed is it, the the nature problems don't depress me as much as the fear that people are not going to take it seriously and and solve these problems i think that we we are on our way to understanding the science of a lot of the problems that plague us but I fear a little bit that we are not well on the way to politically solving those problems. But I still hold out hope because I know that information is power. And the more we understand, the more it becomes obvious that what we understand is real, the more we have the capacity to act. That's my hope anyway. I hope so. Um... Let's see, I'd like to sort of uh, switch gears a little bit and talk about, um, you know, com uh, you know, some of the commercialization uh, things going on in uh, in Montana. You know, Montana's, you know, a growing uh, cluster on uh, in photonics and, you know, one of the uh, one of the big hotspots uh, in the United States. Uh, what would you say have been some of the core successes uh, that have led to the uh, Montana Photonics Clusters, you know, ability to facilitate and foster growth in the uh, the commercial uh, sector? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for recognizing that. I mean, I, I came to Montana State University 22 years ago, and that simultaneously seems like a long time and a short time. Um, but my roots in Montana go back much further than that. I have family history in Montana all the way back to the 1860s. And so Montana has always been an important place to me and a, a special place to me. And I'm very proud to live there now and to be part of this exciting growth that, that you're mentioning. Um, we are actually becoming more and more recognized. And when I first came to the university there, I would go to conferences, you know, photonics and optics conferences, and my name badge would say Montana State University. People would look at that and say, wait, what? <laughs> Montana? Why are you there? And now that has completely turned around. People know that, oh yeah, just like you said, we are one of the leading clusters of activity, both research, educational, and commercial activities in optics and photonics. 
And I'm very, very proud of that. I don't think there's anything in my career that I would be more proud of than, than that. And so let me ask, answer your question. You know, what have we done? What, are, what have been some successes that have helped create that? Because that did not happen by accident. And it did not happen in many other places that it could have happened. It happened in Bozeman, Montana, and it's starting to grow and expand throughout the state of Montana, primarily because of, I think, three things. One, there were some adventurous people who were very, very bold because back then, and I'm talking about the 1980s and early 90s, back then it was it was not like it is today. Today we can go almost anywhere and have high-speed internet and imagine running a high-tech business. In 1980, that was not the case, right? And so it took a lot of courage and, and uh, quite frankly, vision to, to make that move. But there were a couple people who came home to Montana after having graduated from Montana State University and they just wanted to be there because it was such a great place to live. Um, speaking of the environment, you know, it's just a fabulous natural environment. Good people, it's a good place. So they wanted to be there and they came and tried to run a company there and, and it succeeded. But part of the reason that it succeeded is my number two reason, which is the university stepped up and took ownership of this opportunity. The and I really credit that to my predecessors. Uh, there was a physics, a laser physics faculty member who thought if I do some of these things that are different from what a normal physics person does, maybe it will help establish a couple of jobs so that a few of my students can stay here instead of leaving. And so he started collaborating with a startup company and then he went on to create he got some money from the National Science Foundation. We we owe a huge uh, debt of gratitude to the National Science Foundation EPSCOR program, which sent some money our way to establish a program that we called the Optical Technology Center. And that center is sort of an umbrella organization that brings together faculty and students from across campus and focuses our effort on activities that can help sustain, create and sustain and grow startup companies in the photonics space. And I now have the pleasure of directing that center and I have for 19 years going on 20 years. And that, that center was created officially uh, in 1995, but the roots of it go back into the, you know, at least five years before that. So that's the second thing. And then the third thing we did is we just hired faculty members who had the proper mindset. You know, not all researchers want to be bothered with industry. And that's that's an unfortunate mentality. And we really don't have that problem at Montana State University. We have, by and large, we have in the optics and photonics space, we have faculty who are excited about that. And so we collaborate with industry. We we encourage our graduate students to become entrepreneurs. We've helped create, you know, more than 30, almost 40 companies in, in the Bozeman area. And these companies by and large were all started by our PhD and master's graduates. These are all graduate students that studied laser physics and remote sensing systems and optical design with, with me and other people at the university, and they've gone out and started companies. And they did that out of self-defense. They just didn't want to leave. They wanted to hold on to their ski pass. And so they they stayed in Montana or they came home to Montana. And it's really, uh, it has reached way, way beyond critical mass. I think 10 years ago, we reached critical mass. And now we're we're just at this exciting level where there's, there's a really solid cluster of companies and experts running around so that if you need to change jobs, you can just walk across the street instead of leaving the state. And, you know, this I hear the students talking on campus about if you want to stay in Montana, you know, go study lasers because there's jobs. And boy, that's a new conversation that 
three decades ago could not have been imagined. So I'll stop there because otherwise I could go on all day and all night on this topic. Sure, sure. <laughs> Uh, so what's, uh, you know, what is the academia and R&D side, you know, doing to help ensure that the, the you know, the transfer of technology, you know, bridge, uh, so to speak, to industry, uh, what are they doing to make sure that that bridge is, uh, is strong and robust, I guess, for lack of a better word? Yeah, yeah, sure, I get it. Um... By and large, we we are doing simple things, but but it, they're getting more and more complex. <laughs> but at, at the root, and this is my role as director of the Optical Technology Center, um, what I really view as my most important job is to help create and sustain relationships. So we hold an annual conference, and we have been since the 90s. This annual conference puts faculty, students, and industry people in the same room. And that's where we share ideas. We exchange technical information. We, you know, we eat and drink together and we visit. And some of those conversations lead to new collaborations or new research proposals. And we, we often submit proposals in partnership with companies. So we have a steady stream of SBIR and STTR proposals, but these days it's becoming bigger than that. We, we're submitting a lot of proposals to big programs that are just being launched to create, you know, technology hubs and innovation regions. They, there's a lot of opportunity right now to do that, and we're we're very aggressively going after those in partnership with both Montana and non-Montana industry. And I think that's that's the direction that I see us heading that's that's sort of unique to today from as opposed to yesterday, yesteryear, is we have in we have increasing collaborations and relationships with non-Montana companies because the word is out, you know, and so there's a lot of a lot of national and international companies who know about us. And they're coming to us for students and for help, and we're just delighted to have those relationships. So yeah, it's it's growing rapidly, and 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 is sort of it's exciting, but it's it's kind of daunting also. It's it's growing so fast. Um, I guess I only partly answered your question though. You know, we we have these conferences, we have a we have a regular colloquium series, we submit proposals together. But really, a lot of the important work is done at the grassroots level, on the ground. Every faculty member sort of takes ownership. And we we have faculty, like I said, we hired the right people with the right mentalities. And our faculty are really great at encouraging their students to do this. So we look around us and all these companies are run by our former students. That fact is not lost on our current students. They realize that, oh, that person was in my shoes just five or 10 years ago, or you know, 15 or 20 years ago now. And I also can become the next cool company in Bozeman. And the they're simple things, but they're really, really important things. And they're things that are done strategically. And that that's really the the core, I think, of, of it is to have people who are tasked with thinking strategically about growing the community, not just growing the academic programs. And that's my job. And that's that's a part of my job that I really, really cherish. Uh, can you tell us, you know, specifically, you know, how your lab uh, has contributed to that growing optics cluster uh, in Montana? And you've already, uh, you know, touched upon that mm -hmm. a little bit. I think you mentioned, you know, 30 or so companies, uh, you know, have come have come out of, uh, you know, Montana State and your, uh, you know, your lab. Uh, what's it like to see these technologies and techniques that you and your students have produced in the lab? uh be deployed in the field you know commercially well i mean it's it's very satisfying and and really i will go back to what i said earlier 
that really it's all about the people. And that's what excites me even more than the technology that I see being commercialized. I can see our, and I will say our, because it's certainly a, by no means me alone. It, it's all of us who are teaching and doing research in optics and photonics. We, I see our technology all over the ecosystem. When I look at the companies that are in Bozeman, I can see technologies that started as licenses of patents or licenses of know-how in Montana State University. And that's satisfying to, to say the least. But even more satisfying is to see the people who used to be our students become successful business owners and successful employees of those businesses and be happy. And you know, they're raising their families and they're they're leading a successful professional life. And they're not having to sacrifice the quality of their lifestyle, and, and they're not having to sacrifice the quality of their career. So they have it. They have just as good a job as they would have if they left the state, and probably better. And so they have these great jobs in a great place, and it's just nice to see that happen. It's also nice to see the technologies that we work so hard on, and the science that we work so hard on, find application in real systems but but really i think the longest lasting satisfaction comes from seeing it, the economic growth is great but because of that economic growth it allows people to be there and, and it allows us to have long lasting relationships and that's that's just really special excellent uh what is it about remote sensing uh that you would say you know makes it such an appealing industry uh, to the Montana cluster and the uh, state's economic interests. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think it goes back to the strategic thinking of my predecessors, who I've credited before, and I will continue to credit. Um, I remember specifically one day in the 1990s, for example, when I had gotten to know the few people who were up here. I was living not in Montana at the time, and I had, I had gotten to know a few of the people who had started this program, the Optical Technology Center, and they were talking to me about what, what their next steps were. And they could see that there was a possibility of them having a significant role in the LIDAR technology space, for example. At that time, they had nobody that did LIDAR up here. But they had all kinds of expertise in laser physics. And that laser physics research, as I mentioned earlier, was leading to new materials. New materials were leading to new lasers and new abilities to tune those lasers and stabilize those lasers. And they just had the idea that that all these lasers hanging around had nothing to, they had nothing to do with all these lasers. And so they were looking around and they saw LIDAR as a, as a potential space where they could contribute. And they knew that I was working in that space. So they started asking me, you know, is this practical? Are there things that our technology would be useful for? And I said, oh gosh, yeah, let's talk about all the ways. And those conversations began, and those really were the were the start of of my transition to to leaving my old job and and coming to Montana, because they said, "Well, we really need somebody like you to help us make that transition." And so they were thinking strategically about where their stuff was going to go next and who they needed to hire to get it there. And because of that, they hired people like me, not just me, but other folks that do really great work in this space now. And now we're very well recognized. And, you know, some of our companies are LIDAR companies. And and then that sort of, I think, that what that type of thinking permeates the ecosystem and starts spawning other ideas. And so one of the laser companies that started up in the early days split and spun off a company doing hyperspectral imagery. 
systems. Well, that's not laser physics, but it's the same kind of thinking. You know, it's thinking about what lasers can do in remote sensing led them to think about what imaging systems could do in remote sensing. And then there's the other side of the equation, which is our natural environment is very special to us. I mean, that's by and large what brought a lot of us to Montana. And so we care about it and we probably pay more attention to it than people living in some other places. We we think about measuring it, we think about preserving it. And so that that has permeated a lot of the research going on at the university. And it is it is landing inside that way of thinking is landing inside of some of these companies. And so we have some very successful companies that are building commercial optical systems for doing environmental measurements. It's it's just a it's a natural synergy. I, I like to say that in Montana we do world class optics in a unparalleled world class environment. And I choose those words because they go together. Excellent. Now I was thinking uh sort of when we we had uh I had kind of an inelegant segue between you know the um talking about you know remote sensing in the environment uh and commercialization uh and so as we've been talking i've been thinking kind of about you know that dichotomy you know commercialization uh is or can be you know in some ways you know at odds uh very much with yeah. environmentalism you know i'm thinking specifically you know every now and again you'll see a news story uh i'm thinking about uh you know they found um you know, whatever it was, like hundreds of thousands of copies of the old ET video game, uh, you know, just kind of buried in the desert. Uh, maybe okay, that was yeah. an urban legend, I, you know. Uh, <laughs> but in any case, you know, you'll see you'll see pictures of, you know, unsold cars uh, just sure. sitting there, you know. Uh, but, you know, it's important to note that, you know, not every company, you know, is kind of looking at that old model of, you know, hyper production and overproduction. Uh, and it seems like in Montana specifically, you know, you mentioned those, you know, those values about, you know, valuing, valuing the environment and, you know, appreciating it. You know, how is the remote sensing industry, you know, kind of different uh, in that capacity? Uh, and how is it different in uh, Montana? Yeah, I, I think it's a fair question. And I, I know when I, when I think about Montana's history, it is not all, it is by no means an environmental success story, right? There there are lots of environmental failures in Montana's history. And we have, we have multiple Superfund sites. We have a lot of examples of where extractive industries have damaged in very serious ways the natural environment that we also love and, and cherish in Montana. And so, yes, that that exists and that's all around us. But that that's what makes it special, really, of what we're doing now is because. By and large, the the optics industry is a clean industry. We are not digging holes to make lasers well. You could argue that somebody is somewhere, right? Because we're using raw materials that come from mining. And so I'm not here saying that mining is evil. I'm saying that if all you have is mining and then you're shipping away your raw materials to somebody else to make the products, that's that's a step along the economic development uh, evolutionary ladder, but it's not it's not where you want to stay. You don't want to you don't want to run your economy based on purely extractive things because you'll just run out of those things. But making lasers and making lidars and selling them or using them to create data that you sell, that's a very sustainable kind of uh, business model. And that's where we're going now. And you could argue that we couldn't have gotten here without stepping on the shoulders of of the early Montana uh, economic. I was trying to search for the word. It kept coming out environment in my head, but 
you know, the early Montana economy was was not very pretty to the environment, but it it got us started <laughs> and and it maybe maybe it even helped focus our attention on being better and not doing only those things. And actually, right now we're in a very interesting part of our our evolution that we are looking around saying we have this new modern industry but it's by and large focused in and around Bozeman, which is where our university is. And Montana is a very big state. There's an awful lot of Montana that doesn't ever see Bozeman. And we're trying to expand so that we can then benefit those folks. And a lot of the industries that the people in those areas of Montana, a lot of the industries that they, subs that they survive on are agriculture and mining and you know all these kinds of things that that some of some of what we're talking about that can be done in more sustainable ways and that's our quest now is to bring our technology to the table sit down with those people and say how can we help you and we really want it to be driven by them because you know we don't know what problems they need to solve and I'll give you an example of that. Eight years ago, the state of Montana put some money on the table for a research program that was specifically for economic development, research that could aid economic development. And I knew immediately where I wanted to, what, what I wanted to do. One of the things that I wanted to do was figure out how to expand our optical sensing capabilities in ways that would help the rest of the state. And so I called up the agriculture school, which is a major success at Montana State University. And I said, what problems do you have that we could possibly help you with? And we brainstormed for a while and we picked two problems, one that seemed really hard and one that seemed pretty easy. And we said, let's try those. And we succeeded at both actually, thank goodness. And that launched, that helped launch us into a direction now that is a growth area in our university, which is precision agriculture. And that's a mechanism, that's one of several mechanisms through which we hope to expand the economic benefits of optics and photonics throughout the state so that it becomes a benefit statewide and not just a Bozeman thing. And it also helps preserve natural resources. And we're also working on some proposals right now to work with people that are involved with mining and some of the more, you know, extractive industries and forestry. Uh, precision forestry now is a is a term that we're talking a lot about. And our technologies have a lot to offer those kinds of things to make them happen in a more sustainable way. So in a way, we're trying to come full circle and, and help those things. Excellent. Thank you so much. This has been such a great conversation. Yeah, it's been fun. It's always fun to talk about these things. Thanks for, for inviting me. Sonathana Kanugalu's expertise lies in creating reference points that ensure accuracy across the biophotonics field. It keeps with the focus of today's episode. But the work underway at Biopix S bridges two of the other technology areas that have infused our programming this season. Kanugalu, co-founder of the Cork, Ireland-based company, joins us to discuss the role of Biopix S's one-of-a-kind biophotonics phantoms. The technology serves as a gateway to biophotonics standardization. Tissue-mimicking optical phantoms enable practitioners to validate clinical methodologies, develop algorithms, and perform the testing, characterization, and instrument calibration necessary to advance biophotonic techniques and foster the establishment of new modalities. In its quest to better protocols for microscopy, spectroscopy, optical coherence tomography, fluorescence imaging, and other biophotonics technologies, Biopix S targets both the instrumentational and procedural hurdles facing end users. The company's FNIRS Phantom, for example, is offered to system developers to gauge the efficacy of equipment as well as the likelihood to achieve a positive outcome amid a range of variables. Knugaloo, who has a background in spectroscopy, 
brings with him a message that places a premium on the value of biophotonic standardization and biometrology. The pinnacle for many of the optical techniques in use today, and still forthcoming, cannot be reached in a vacuum. To that end, he says, neither can biophotonics itself. That's why Biopix S is all in on integrated photonics. It wasn't the link we were expecting, but the possibilities for wearables, integrated sensors, lab on a chip technology, and treatment at the point of care are dynamic and vast. As an enabler to techniques spanning photoacoustics to diffuse optics, Biopix S's role on the value chain is fluid. Already, however, it is in prime position to propel the next wave of biophotonic standardization. So I want to begin um, with a, a question that's fairly standard and straightforward, but that will help guide our conversation. And it's uh, a definition question. What is a phantom? And when I ask you that, what is a phantom? We're speaking, of course, through a biophotonics context. Right. So in biophotonics context, optical phantoms are technically objects that mimic biological tissue. So they can basically recreate any body. We can basically recreate any, any organ in your body. So basically optical terms, when you put, can I start again? Sorry, Jake. Yep. Can yep, I just start again? Conversation? Right. Yep. Okay, start your question. We will get, get forward. Yep. I want to begin with a, a definition question that is going to be uh, instrumental in guiding the, the next few questions in our conversation. Um, and it's about phantoms. What is a phantom? And when I ask you that, we're speaking, of course, through a biophotonics context exclusively. Right. In biophotonics context, phantoms are object that technically mimic biological tissue. For example, take head, brain, or hands. So we can create objects that optically, meaning they will have same kind of light interaction as our human body will have. So those are basically phantoms and they can be used for various purposes for example for characterizing a device doing development and also for validating device at a later stage of development then when they are developed and when they are in clinic or in real 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 field use we can use it for calibration or routine checks so and they can be used to standardize the whole technology of biophotonics and that's what in nutshell the phantoms are Excellent. Okay, so we're, we're, we're talking about tissue at, at, at the core here, um, and then we're talking also about a wide range of applications and durability. We could be talking about mimicking an application with a light guided element, uh, a, a sensor without an embedded light source, anything, as long as the, the, the tissue mimicking aspect is there. Um, and, and that is interesting for a number of reasons, but in terms of applications, it's very vast, right? So wide range of techniques and modalities that can be worked from this framework. Um, and, and this is clear, of course, from the distinct product offerings uh, that your company has, has made available here. Um, one of the primary positive outcomes is this move towards standardization. And correct me if I'm wrong, but that really is a priority of the Biopic Standard um, Initiative. Indeed, indeed, it's one of our uh, key priorities, the standardization. Uh, why? If you look at it, like our biophotonics market, technically, if you look at it, it's 128 billion. It's a very big market. Uh, and it's also a vibrant market. What do I mean by that? It has a growth rate of 10.5%. So whenever you see such a big growth rate, that means so many things are happening so fast and how you are going to modulate them how you are going to make sure you get the best out of it. For this, you need some standardized methods and methodologies that you can follow that will accelerate the development of these processes. So in this way, if you see like standard standardization of methods to build new technology is important, but it's also a big market as, as you see, like it's 128 billion. So which means already there are many things that are already built. Those things need technically high level standards so that they can be used in day to day life in a reliable way so that we set standards for the companies who are creating these new devices to follow. So what biopics, how specifically biopics addresses here? Biopics addresses this by developing phantoms. What we do, the phantoms are highly reliable objects and recreatable objects, and they are highly reproducible results, which means they can be used at different stages of product development and also for field doing the field uh, field trials or deployment to understand the quality of the overall product. 
So in this way, standardization plays a key role, but the phantoms through bio, where the biopics is invest, investing and investigating is also playing a key role in bringing forth uh, the growth of the market and and making sure that they are that they are at the best. And we are able to do it by focusing more on standardization through phantoms for biophotonics. I want to ask you about the origin of biopics, the company. Um, there are obviously certainly uh, biometrology working groups in, in, in full laboratories um, around the world. So th this, this notion of standardization for biomedicine is not new. Um, and, and yet in the industry, it is a relatively, I don't want to say underserved, but perhaps underdeveloped space. How did the company come about? Right. So you, you pointed out in your question, there was a gap. There was a gap that was that was filled but no one was brave enough to take it and fill it out because it needs a huge, deep technical expertise. So let's talk about the origins, right? The origins dates back to my PhD when I was in Milan. So I was inventing this new technique called frequency offset Raman spectroscopy. So when you are inventing something new, it's not that you are inventing new, you have to demonstrate it, which means you have to create a lot more things that didn't exist. So I wanted a phantom that had a maximum contrast in absorption scattering between two different wavelengths. And I experimented a lot in understanding how the phantoms work, how to create such properties. And that was my initial point. Apart from that, my former, my former group where I did my PhD, they were experts in biophotonics or tissue mimicking phantoms and tissue mimicking phantoms based standardization. And from there, I learned that's where the genesis started. That I learned how important is it and how everyone wants it, but no one has deep expertise to do it. And everyone do, does it, but in their own way, nothing is standardized. So that's where I fill the gap. I moved to Cork because like, I like the supportive entrepreneur, entrepreneur ecosystem that we have here. And I co-founded co -founded Biopics in this particular space where I fill the gap. And that's how the origins of Biopics are. Now what we are doing, we are just working with all this key stakeholders across academia, industry, including hospitals, to see how we can create standardized methods through phantoms for accelerating biophotonics development and tra clinical translation. I think anybody who's familiar with the, the uh, not just Cork, but the, the full Irish photonics uh, base, and we had David McGovern on earlier this season, um, co-founder David McGovern. So it's a very uh, robust space and a lot of expertise and in, in idea sharing in that community. Uh, you mentioned your background in spectroscopy. You're a spectroscopist. Were there any core applications or, or modalities or, or um, medical needs that the company had in mind when it came about? Right. Uh, means w w one thing that we felt the gap in the beginning, and we still believe, like we, we are still perceiving it, is that clinical trials and preclinical trials. So a lot of animals have been exploited, and you can count them. There are thousands of animals every, every day be, being euthanized or killed. Uh, because of uh, clinical, preclinical testing. It's not that we are we can completely replace it, but phantoms can to some extent uh, kind of, you know, reduce it. So that's what we are trying to address. Is one of the key things that we see clinically, how we can address this is by creating phantoms that can potentially reduce preclinical and clinical trials so that your device can be optimized as much as possible on this highly reliable tissue mimicking phantoms. Of course, later on, you can use it on, on the real clinical trial, which is, of course, it's required. And another aspect of the company is that many of the devices, if you see the pulse oximeters, recent times there was this racial bias and it's well known, it doesn't work. I'm just giving one example. Like this, many of the optical devices in the market uh, doesn't perform well and they all have limitations. And the idea of, again, the phantoms is to address them in a reliable way so that it can be benchmarked across different companies and also to provide a, a, a metric where all companies can report same kind of results uh, and also provide results that are highly reliable with time so that uh, this can improve the performance of the optical devices that are used in clinic uh, and, and in addition provide reliable results that can really improve the clinical outcome. 
Are there any core tests or functionalities or, or experimental procedures that the company has identified as the most popular or most common or, or maybe a better way to ask this question is, are there any uses for the products that you've identified as um, sort of fundamental to the biopics mission? Right, some fundamental products. I, maybe I can talk about something that we are working in recently, right? So we are I also part of, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we are also part of this uh, standardization working group of oximeters uh, in ISO and IEC. So as part of that, we are building this amazing uh, together with all the key stakeholders across the world, uh, FNIS standard, functional layer and first spectroscopy. I don't know how many of audience have heard about it. One of the cool things that, the, that they are trying to achieve is kind of brain computer interface where you want to interface your mind through optics and development of such technology has, has a great impact on humanity but it also needs kind of standardized methods so that the efforts of great minds are not lost so we have we are building this or we are updating the standard that was existing and biopics did play a pivotal role i can tell you the recent project product that we launched is basically around this phantom that can be used to implement actually the standard. This can be seen in our website and uh, and it can be, it, and now it is possible for anyone out there to buy this phantom and use them and make their, make their research a lot more reliable and benchmark across the community. This is just one example of like how a real world example uh, our phantoms do play. I, I think it's another uh, another interesting area of discussion here is the full biophotonics value chain, right? And there are several um, real discernible trends that are happening in biophotonics at any given time. But right now you see things like, um, for example, uh, diagnostics or, or, or treatment even at the point of care, the miniaturization of instruments. How does a, a new era in standardization tie in to not just current trends, but this idea that trends are constantly evolving, right? It, it, it's, it's something that you must keep in mind when you're developing a product in a field or an industry that is designed for constant progress. Exactly, 10.5% constant growth. It's a, it's a very vibrant market. No, I, I, absolutely. So how do we address it? This, this is a very, very interesting area and it's exciting time for us. Why? Means when things are being miniaturized, as you said, like point of care or wearable sensing, uh, the devices that are perfected in a shoebox size, you are trying to shrink it into a wearable. What are the things that you that you are challenged when you do that? You primarily challenge on the performance of the device. You need to make some compromises. So what we can do to get around the compromise to a good extent by is by providing highly uh, reliable phantom that can increase, increase improve, improve the performance. Just to give an example, you have a source, external light source, that is highly stabilized by using tech controllers, coolers, uh, so on and so forth. But if you are going to put them in a wearable watch, it may not be that stable. But no need for you to have that stable if you have a phantom that can reliably calibrate it in real time. So as you see, more and more the devices are going to become smaller and smaller. There will be a lot more pressure on its performance. And what we address specifically is to improve those performance by using our phantoms. So this, this is an exciting area, and I think the field heading towards the direction is inevitable and uh, unavoidable. It's going to happen, and we are excited. And already we do have some traction in that direction, uh, and we are excited, excitingly awaiting the future where we will be doing more in this space. And I, I named two two trends, and, and they may be fairly obvious, right? They're not necessarily uh, the newest trends in the field, miniaturization and, and point of care instrumentation. Um, and certainly in your position, you have access to um, all sorts of trends and things that aren't yet trends. And you, you mentioned your work in pulse oximetry. Is there anything happening now or right on the cusp of happening that you have your eyes on? Right. Uh, not sure how much I can get into details. Of it. There is a lot <laughs> it is a question. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It is a question yeah. that uh, is tricky in that way. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. But, but I think, you know what, I can certainly disclose some aspects of it. Integrated photonics, you know, the, the semiconductor shortage 
and there is chip sack everywhere. There is US has its own chip chip sack, and we have in Europe its own version of it. And within European, there are many of these things happening. And integrated photonics is gaining also a lot more attention as part of it because it's also you know chiplets and chips. And what what we are doing, uh, maybe I can't get into details, but what we what what what's the direction that is heading is as I just mentioned before. Things are going to be miniaturized to a level where its performance is going to be hindered. But the performance can be kept intact if there is a way to calibrate the tool in real time. And I can tell you we have some exciting things happening to address specifically that. I can disclose one of it is like we already filed an IP in this particular space on how we will be improving the performance of the device, though it is miniaturized. And despite all the possible troubles that it is caused, it, it, it's it, that you get in because of miniaturization, like detection instabilities and source instabilities. Uh, it's a it's a space to look after. Just follow us, and uh, for sure, I am I am sure. Like in one of the next podcasts, we will be discussing more about <laughs> it when a lot more exciting things happening in this space. I'll ask you another uh, a follow up question that maybe you can't answer. When we talk about integrated photonics, right, it, the, the reach is quite broad. When you talk about integrated photonics, are you talking about it in the context of it being a technology embedded in a product or, or perhaps as part of a technology that you're offering support? I mean, it's a subtle distinction. Right, 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 right. So when we say integrated photo photonics, like what we mean by that? Uh, like you would have heard maybe some days like, hey, heterogeneous integration or hybrid integration. When you say heterogeneous integration, it's everything is integrated in a silicon wafer or hybrid is a couple of chiplets grown in a different ways and put, a, put it out in a platform. And what, what concerns biopics addresses both these markets in the sense like we make phantoms or we make technology specifically designed based on the idea of tissue mimicking phantoms that can be static or dynamic that allows these small chiplets to be highly, highly stable and reliable and high performing devices. Sometimes at times we can mention numbers like it can be from 2x to number of times like 10x, 20x times the performance gain that you will get uh, by using uh, this kind of integration. Uh, I'm not sure I answered your question, but the idea here is yes, what I mean by integrated photonics is we do offer services means for some clients where we integrate our technology into their platform or we even handhold some of the clients in which case we provide the phantom technology and handhold them in to integrate that into their own platform. Yeah, it's it's just it's an interesting conversation, right? Whenever you're talking about a, a new technology area but also new techniques and new practices. Uh, it's tough one to disclose everything because you can't, uh, but it's also just an interesting conversation because you're talking about, you know, a trail that is yet to be blazed. I want to give you a chance and we'll end our conversation on this. I want to give you a chance to talk about the distinct product offerings that Biopix has available because when you're working with any number of techniques and any number of technologies, you can't just have one product. And certainly that also supports the notion of standardization, right? You're, you're talking about many different things. Right, 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 right. So I just want to start that by saying like, that at least my vision of Biopixis is like, it's a one-stop solution for every possible biophotonic standardization need. And so that's our vision. Right now we address wide range of markets, but we will be keep expanding. So look out in this space. So we can distinguish our products in number of ways, right? So one way is just based on the technology. Like you take uh, diffuse optics or tissue optics or optical coherence tomography or photoacoustics and Raman spectroscopy. Uh, what else? So uh, and also microscopy, like even two photon microscopy. So we build already products or at least uh, at least few products in each of this technology. Some of them are already available on our website. Some of them are custom made solutions for which we are still looking into how we can make a product that is uh, used by all the community. So that is based on technology, we can distinguish them or we can distinguish our products based on the application space, like saying oh, whether it's on wearables, 
or it is on a point of care device or it's a bedside device. Uh, is it used for deep tissue imaging or is it used for just superficial topographic imaging like OCT? So even we can categorize based on that uh, on that too. So set this means if you want to know more about our products, it's quite simple. Just type in biopicstandards.com. You would see all of it. And if you are building any exciting technology in this area of biophotonics, feel free to reach out to us. We would try our best to see like how we can help each other to grow the community as well as to provide best in class solution to, to society uh, in the space of biophotonics. So with this, saying. I just would like to, yeah, 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 thank you. It's just going to say it goes without saying we'll see you at Photonics West and, and BIOS before it, and, and certainly a great chance for collaboration there. Sana, thank you so much for the time and for introducing a new era in uh, biophotonic standards. Thank you so much, Jake. It was a pleasure to have to, to be here and to join to join you. That concludes this week's episode of All Things Photonics. Thank you to our engineer, Alan Shepard and to our news editor, Jake Saltzman, as well as to this week's sponsors. Our featured music is courtesy of betterwithmusic.com. Most of all, thank you, our listeners. As always, you can share your thoughts, pitch us ideas, and let us know how we're doing. You can reach us at allthings at photonics.com. All Things Photonics is available on all major platforms, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, as well as on our website, photonics.com. <laughs>